Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Our listener support and appreciation campaign continues. You can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. This is the last day of our campaign. Obviously, we continue to welcome listener support throughout the year. And I would also encourage you to complete our advertising survey at adsurvey.greatdetectives.net. If you are in the U.S. or Canada, you can give us valuable information to help us find the best possible sponsor for the podcast. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of Dragnet. The original air date, January 19th, 1950, and the title is The Big Man Part 2. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Narcotics Bureau. For seven months, you've been working with federal and state agents in breaking a narcotics ring. You've apprehended the small fry. Next in the line, the big man. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, July 9th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Narcotics Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way into work, and it was 3.58 p.m. when I got to room 24, Narcotics Bureau. Hi, Joe. Feel better? Well, I'm not quite as tired, Ben. That Costello thing was a long haul. Narcotics from Merrill. Okay, Bacon. I'll tell him. Meeting's in five minutes. Chief Brown's over. Okay, I want to pick up my stuff from the captain first. Hi, Skipper. Come on in. A little better, Friday. Get some rest. Yeah, and a couple of good meals. That's the trouble with the Flats gang. They never knew where to eat. Sit down, Joe. I want to talk to you. We got a couple of minutes before the meeting. You'll probably be getting this all up and down the line from here in. Just want to let you know that we think you and all the men in the operation did a fine job. My part wasn't much. You did more than I did. Oh, we all worked, but you had the dirty end of it. Good job. Here's your equipment. You need it now. Oh, yeah, thanks. Badge, your ID card, your gun, six shells, that's all of it, huh? Mm-hmm. That's it, thank you. You're back at it. Yep. Here's one for you. Look at this. What's that you got? Mug shot of a girl picked up in a narcotics raid last night. Oh, pretty girl. Long, blonde hair, beautiful eye. She looks young. High school girl? She was when that picture was taken, 1947. She was 16. Here, look at this one. Yeah. Same girl. Yeah. That's the way she looked at 11.30 last night when we picked her up. She looks 50. 19 years old. Three years on heroin. She might as well be dead. She is. Eight o'clock this morning. Let's go. It's time for the meeting. You just looked at the best reason I know of for getting Belmont. Did she get her stuff from Belmont? Costello was pushing to her. He got his stuff from Belmont, the old one. Romero, let's go. All right, William. Anybody brief you on the Costello interview, Joe? No, no, not yet. Chief Brown will fill you in. Here we are. Chief? Gentlemen, come on in. You 
Well, men all know each other. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hiya, Craig. Uh, Captain White, I think you and your men know Policewoman Caswell. Yes, sir. How are you, Florence? Hello. I'm Miss Caswell, Inspector Virgil Beckner, State Narcotics. How do you do? Oh, yeah. Bill Craig, agent in charge, Federal Narcotics. Hello. How do you do? Before we get into the Belmont procedure, let's see how we stand on the Cattell case. Uh, White, do you want to fill everybody in on information we got from Ralph Costello? Yes, sir. Uh, after his arrest Monday night, we interrogated Costello for about four hours. We confronted him with the package he sold to Friday here. How'd the stuff test? Crime lab ran it through, about a third of an ounce of heroin, fair quality Mexican stuff. The man we picked up with Costello, Tony Morris, was questioned as well. He corroborated Costello's story. <clears throat> What'd you get from him? Well, he told us he had a great deal of information on the big man in the operation, Belmont. <clears throat> but he wouldn't tell us a thing unless we made a deal with him. What kind of a deal? He wanted everything. But we finally agreed that the only thing we might possibly work out was his prison term. Mm -hmm. We called in the U.S. District Attorney. We talked another four hours. How'd it work out? District Attorney told Costello the only thing he'd do for him was to have his prison terms run concurrently rather than consecutively. Not much to pay for what we got. Costello gave us enough to enable us to start moving on Belmont right away. We've had his memo confirmed. We've got a list of most of his pushers. Now we can get to him. Any definite plan, Chief? Oh, White and I have been talking over here with Craig and Beck. We worked out what we think might be a pretty good plan. Uh, Craig, do you want to lay out how your men are going to handle it from the federal end? We'll work from out of town to the center here. We'll check his contacts across the state lines. We've already traced his connections to the east, New York Syndicate. We'll keep working that end. Beck, uh, how about your state narcotics men? We'll work inside the state line here. We've already checked out part of his operations. We've <clears> located <throat> sources in San Francisco, Bakersfield, Fresno, as far south as San Diego, Lower California. We'll draw all those ends up tight. Keep moving. You fellows will both give us a hand if we need assistance. You bet. Yeah, that's right. Fine. Uh, White, what are we going to do locally? Oh, it's going to be a case of taking what we know and finding out what we don't know, putting the two together. Seems to me to be a case of watching the man at all times. Belmont shouldn't be able to blow his nose without one of our men knowing it. It's going to be a tremendous undertaking. You all know the tough job it is shadowing narcotics, man. They're fidgety, hypersensitive. They recognize anything out of the ordinary at once. Well, for that reason, it can't be a one-man operation. Everybody's got to work. Our undercover won't work this time. They're no doubt alerted. So we'll work it from another angle. When do we start? We've already started. Belmont lives in Manhattan Beach. His house is under surveillance. Has been since yesterday. Well, I can impress upon all of you the importance of not letting Belmont out of your sight for an instant. A narcotics buy could be made in 30 seconds. If we're not there at the instant, we lose him. Do we have anything at all as to when he might be ready to deal again? Nothing. Nobody seems to know Belmont's exact operating time. Could be any time. And in order to prosecute him, we've got to be there when the narcotics are in his possession or under his control. So we start to live with him and stay as close as we can without being tabbed until there's a buy. That's it. Captain White has all the assignments for our local men. Okay. We'll watch him. We'll stay close to him. If he makes a move, be there. The meeting lasted four hours. During that four hours, a plan was formulated which we hoped would end in the successful apprehension of the number one man in Pacific Coast narcotics traffic. Arthur Z. Belmont. How do you watch a man, his every move, for 24 hours, day in, day out, without his knowing it? How do you watch a man whose very existence depends upon not being watched, who is expertly schooled in every trick and device of police surveillance, whose method of operation will change with the slightest disturbance of his daily routine, and if that M.O. changes, you've lost him? Thursday, July 10th, in the small Los Angeles suburb of Manhattan Beach, population 10,172, Three very ordinary events took place. A public nurse began a house-to-house -house survey. She asked the simple question, have you ever been vaccinated for smallpox? She started canvassing 27 blocks from the home of Belmont. Policewoman Florence Caswell. Two Japanese gardeners new to the city of Manhattan Beach began soliciting work. They started asking for jobs 38 blocks from the home of Belmont. Sergeant Ten Fujikuni and Patrolman John Kagawa. A team of surveyors driving a station wagon marked with the seal of Los Angeles County began taking linear measurements for the proposed enlargement of storm drains in the area. They started 14 blocks from the home of Belmont. Lieutenant John Bigham, Central Narcotics, Sergeant Ben Romero, and myself. Okay, Ben, bring in the rod. Let's knock off for lunch. What do you want to eat, John? In the wagon? Better take the transfer with us. Kids might pick it up. Okay. I got it. I can't keep the sand out of my shoes. Might as well get used to it. We're a long ways from home. Yeah. Nine years on the job is the first time I ever brought my lunch in a paper sack. Who knows, Joe? This might change your whole way of living. I bet. 
You want to sit in the front? No, I'm getting back. Fellas, have a look at the local paper? No, why? Manhattan Beach Sentinel, down the bottom of page one in the box. Read it. Yeah, let me see. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, it's good. What is it, Joe? Read it out loud. Well, it says preliminary work on storm drains started. Surveyors. Well, it goes on to say that surveyors have started taking measurements for the new drains. Mm-hmm. Captain White's idea had the story planted, even got a release from the planning commission. Mm, won't hurt us a bit. Well, you said lunchtime. I've got enough here for the whole department. Four hard boiled eggs. See what kind of sandwiches I drew. Deviled egg. Look here. She even put them on egg bread. I hate eggs. Ooh, looks like the captain driving up the street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's him. Driving a city car. Chief engineer. How's it going, Bigham? Hi. Slow. Had your lunch? What do you got? Deviled egg sandwiches. Got plenty. Can't stand them. How about a ham and cheese? Yeah, thanks. Here you go. Hmm. How's everybody else doing? Hmm. Very slow. Takes time. Got to keep taking our time. If we tip it before we got close enough, Belmont's on his way. Mm-hmm. How long are we going to have to keep our distance? Not much longer. We can't take a chance of starting everybody out right on top of Belmont. Right. It might look funny to him. Anybody else would be okay. The average person, your operations might look normal, but we can't afford to try to get it by Belmont that way. Mm. With a hop cutter, you never know. Well, it's not so much that we don't know, we just can't take any kind of a chance. Mm. That's what I mean. You might have started right on Belmont's front lawn, and he's never got wise. But we wouldn't want to risk it. Belmont been out of his house today? He's on the go quite a bit. Left his house at 9.13 a.m., went down to the shop right market, bought a half pound of bacon... Two dozen eggs, loaf of bread, whole wheat. Sergeant Hodges waited on him. He's clerking in the grocery department. Oh, yeah. Then he drove over to his neighborhood gas station, got a full tank of ethyl and two quarts of oil, cut his weight, drove home, got back at 9.42. Are you still there? Yeah. About time you guys were back at it, huh? Right. Okay, Ben. You want to grab some of the gear? Yeah. I got right, Let's go. Hey, Joe. Hmm? Give me a leftover bread crust, will you? I'll give them to the Seagull. Yeah, sure. Here you go. Yeah. Well, foot by foot, we're getting closer to Belmont. Hope nobody tips it. Nobody should, unless you don't trust those gulls. We surveyed the city of Manhattan Beach for five weeks. Policewoman Caswell, posing as a nurse, continued canvassing. Everybody concerned with the job of standing watch over Arthur Z. Belmont carried out their routine day by day. Daily reports came in from everyone in the operation. These reports would be sifted at Central Narcotics and progress reports compiled for the use of those in the field on the Belmont case. All police cars, as well as city cars, such as we were employing, were equipped with three-way radio communication. All personnel were in constant contact with one another. Wednesday, August 12th, it was the decision of Captain Lynn White that the idea of our posing as city surveyors had been exhausted. Further use of this could possibly arouse suspicion. Belmont lived at 1227 Ocean Avenue. Two days before we were called off the surveying job, the city leased the private residence at 1216 Ocean Avenue. A van load of furniture was moved in. Drapes and curtains were hung. Regular deliveries of daily newspapers and milk were made to the house. To all outward appearances, the house was occupied by an average family. Actually, it provided another blind from which we could continue to observe Belmont. Shortwave radio equipment was installed in an upstairs room. Ben and I were assigned the night watch. Another car just stopped in front of Belmont's house. How many does that make? Three cars. Just a minute. Yeah. A couple of guys getting out. Went up the front door. Uh-huh. Where? Let me see, huh? Take a look. Watch Kirk. Uh-huh. Yeah. Belmont answered the door. He's letting him in. Something's doing. What do you think? I don't know. You called Captain White, didn't you? Oh, an hour ago. Just after the first car pulled up. She'll park in the alley and come up the back way. I better check with everybody again. This portable seemed to warm up slower than our car radio. Mm, About the same. Ah, here we go. Unit 140K to Unit 145K. 145K, go ahead. Just checking. Your location the same? That's right. Ocean and Clipper. We got three cars to cover now. Stand by. 
Unit 140K to 143K. 143K, we got it. Standing by. Location still good? Same. Be talking to you. Stand by. 140K to 149K. 149K, go ahead. Stay put. We got three cars now. Yeah, we heard. Still the same spot. Standing by. Roger. Captain, just pulled into the alley, Joe. Don't worry. I'm good. Belmont's porch light just went out. Mm-hmm. Let's see, three guys came in the first car, two in the second, two in the third, is that right? Yeah, seven all told, eight counting Belmont. Maybe he's running for office. Joe, Sam, any changes since you've called me? Another car. Mm-hmm. Anybody you know? I'm too dark to see their faces. Mm-hmm. Dodge Coupe, gray, black packet sedan, green cherry. Well, that might be for me. I told the office they could reach me here. Yeah. White. Yeah, Bigham. You must be wrong. You sure he's not lying? All right, thanks. Yeah. You sure Belmont hasn't left his house since you came on duty? Couldn't possibly. Not without somebody in the details partner. He got out somehow. He made a buy. Captain White called the office and talked to Benny Arredondo, our narcotics undercover man. He confirmed the fact that somehow Belmont had a meet and successfully completed a narcotics transaction. None of us could figure how, and we didn't know when the meet took place. Arredondo told us that the buy had been made sometime in the past ten hours. The arresting officers had recovered a portion of the narcotics, two bindles of heroin. They were found in the possession of one of Belmont's runners, Archie Scott. I can't figure it. What do we do now, Skipper? Sit tight and watch those three cars in front of Belmont's house over there. Maybe he didn't have to leave the house to make a buy. That's the way I got it, Peg. Those cars down there, those are the first visitors he's had in the past 24 hours? As far as anybody knows, we watched it close. Sometimes it's like that. Uh-huh. Well, it looks like somebody's coming out over there. Two guys. How many in there? Eight, counting Belmont. All right, Friday. Get to the cars. Yeah. They start to move out yet? No. Five, six, seven. That's all of them. They're heading for the car. Yeah. Looks like a three-way switch. We'll see when they start to move out. Attention, all units and special details. Stand by. Here's the license numbers, Joe. Oh, good. I need those things. Green Chevy's headed south. Black Packet's going north. So's a Dodge Coupe. Uh Uh-huh. Dodge turned left at the corner. It's headed east now. Got it. 140K to all units and special detail. Unit 149K. 149K, go ahead. 1946 Green Chevrolet Sedan, license 61 William 852, headed south on Ocean. Roger. Unit 145K. 145K, go ahead. 1947 Gray Dodge Coupe, license 1X-Ray 1898, headed east on Clipper Street. Roger. 143K, come in. 143K, yep. 1939 Black Packard Sedan, license 6 Mary 6778, headed north on Ocean. Roger, got him spotted. Could be a dry run, he couldn't afford to chance it either way. Nothing to do now but wait it out. That's right, and pray for rain. It was eight minutes past 8 p.m. We sat back and waited for the reports to come in from the cars. At 8.25 p.m., 17 minutes after the alert was broadcast, Unit 149K reported in on the gray Chevrolet sedan. The car and its occupants were thoroughly searched. No trace of narcotics was found. 8.42 p.m., 34 minutes after the alert. Unit 143K to 140K. 143K, go ahead. On that 1939 package sedan, license 6, Mary 6778. Check them down. Nothing. They're clean. 8.50 p.m., 42 minutes after the alert, the report on the third and final car came in. The 1947 gray Dodge Coupe. That's it. Not a trace of narcotics in any of those three cars. Belmont beat us. Tough luck. It's going to be tougher. Now he knows we're after him. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. The three car switch. Three cars arrive at a given point at different times. The meet takes place. The drivers of the various cars leave the given point at the same time. Each drives away from the point in a different direction, making it three times as difficult to follow them. 
The practice was not new to the Narcotics Bureau or the dealers in narcotics. It usually includes the dry run in which the actual mechanics of the narcotics are carried out, but neither the merchandise nor the money is on hand. This practice forces the narcotics officer into pure guesswork. If the officer doesn't follow up, the buy could be successful. If he chooses to follow up, he takes the chance of exposing himself and tipping his hand on a rehearsal. In the case of this particular car switch, we lost. But taken in the car roundup were seven of Belmont's trusted runners. Six of these men refused to talk, but the seventh, Clifford Bissell, gave us a lead to one of Arthur Belmont's most trusted friends. His name was Floyd Ketchell. He and his wife lived at 357 Evergreen Drive, Linwood. It's a nice house. Yeah. Yes? Uh, police officers, we'd like to ask you a few questions. What about? Well, as you probably know, there's been a series of burglaries here in your neighborhood. No, I didn't know. Oh, yes, quite a few. Uh, would you mind if we came in and talked to you about it? I don't know anything about any robberies around here. Everything's okay. This is just a routine check, Mr. Ketchell. Everybody else in the neighborhood's cooperating. Only take just a minute. All right, you can come in, but I have to leave in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Well, you have a nice place here, Mr. Ketchell. Yes. Now, what was it you wanted me to help you with? You know a man by the name of Clifford Bussell? No. How about Arthur Z. Belmont? Who? Arthur Z. Belmont. Bussell says you and Belmont are good friends. I don't understand this. I thought you wanted to ask me about some robberies. I wonder if you'd mind rolling up your left sleeve. I'd like to look at your arm. What for? You're a user, aren't you? No, I'm not. Then you know what we're talking about, don't you? No, I don't. Do you have any narcotics here in the house? Certainly not. You mind if we look around? Why do you want to search the house? Why won't you show us your left arm? Floyd Ketchell would admit nothing, but he allowed us to search his home and grounds. An extra detail of men was called out to aid us in the search. We covered every foot of the acre of ground. This took two days. We found nothing. On the third day, under the flooring of an upper bedroom of the Ketchell home, we found Ketchell's plant. He was using heroin. You want me to call Belmont, is that the idea? That's right. We want you to set up a meet with him. I'm not going to rat on Art. He's a friend of mine. Well, suit yourself. We found your plant there. We've got you. You'll be the fall guy. You mean I take all the heat? Why not? The cell put the finger on you. We gotta have somebody. Why pick on me? We just told you. We found the stuff here. But cell fingered you. You're it. All you have to do is make a phone call. You won't have a clean slate, but it's gonna sound a lot better in court. All right. It makes sense. You know what to tell him. We've already been over all that. Call him now. Friday, listen in on the extension. If Ketchell changes his mind in the middle of the conversation, I'll see that he hangs up. Yeah. Hi, Art. Floyd Ketchell. How are you, Ketch? Fine. How's Edna? She's fine, Art. Say, I got a friend on his way to Honolulu. Uh-huh. He wants to take a little package along. Gotta have it. You know him? Is he okay? Yeah. Old friend. You sure? Yeah. Have to be pretty careful. Got hit Wednesday night down the beach. Yeah? Who'd they get? The cell and uh, six guys from New York. Got off easy. It was a dry run. I didn't know that. Nothing in the papers. He hasn't hit yet. It will. How much do your friend need? Going to be in the islands for quite a while, so there's a couple of ounces should do it. You got the money now? He's good. Can you swing it tonight? Boat leaves from San Francisco day after tomorrow. He hasn't got much time, has he? Okay, you want to pick it up? Yeah. Uh, all right, if I bring him along, I want you to meet him. Good customer. If you're sure about him, yeah. 8.30 at the store. We'll be there, Art. 1100 cash. Yeah. Better be okay, Kitch. He is. Better be. I had one dry run this week. I can have another. <laughs> 3.22 p.m. We took Mr. and Mrs. Floyd Ketchell back to Central Division where they were booked on suspicion of violation of the State Narcotics Act. 4 p.m. We met in the office of Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. You need $1,100, is that right? Yeah, that's right. How much was in the Secret Service fund? $223. Allotment for this month's all gone. Well, where'd you get the rest of it? You haven't got it all yet. Romero's the banker. How you got it figured, Ben? Well, let's see. I've got it all written down here. I'm... First off, we got $223 cash. And these fellows all gave us their personal checks. Jack Donahoe and Robert gave us $200. Johnny Begum put up $100. And Captain White's in for $150. Joe put in $35 bucks and $22 is all I can swing. That's uh, $720. You need $380, right? Yeah, that's the way I got a figure. Okay, I think I can make up the rest. How about Wynn's Cadillac? He loaned it to you? He's out getting it washed. It's 41 isn't it? 
Yeah, sedan. A little old, but it looks good when it's wise. Flashy. Oh, that's what you need. You gonna make the buy away? Yeah. Ketchell will be with me. Okay. So we're here. Eleven hundred dollars. Yeah, we've only got one hitch. It's five o'clock and the banks are closed. Yeah? Not much time to run around getting checks cashed. It was 5 p.m. We had three hours to cash $720 in personal checks. We split up and covered every possible place in the city where we were known and where we knew they would cash them. By 7.45 p.m., we had the 1100 in cash. The serial number on each bill was listed and the money turned over to Captain White. The scene of the meet was a hardware store on East 9th Street, which Belmont used as a front. Belmont's hardware was located in a small neighborhood shopping district. On Friday nights, the stores remained open until 9 p.m. Promptly at 8.30, Captain White and Floyd Ketchell pulled up in front of the store and went in. Ben and I waited in our car a half a block down the street. It was 8.35. There they are. They're coming out. Must have made Dubai. Starting the car. Here they come. Watch for the skipper's signal, huh? Yeah. There it is. Let's go. Okay, pull over here. Come on. Clerk back there. You see Belmont? No. No, sir. Can I help you? Uh, is Mr. Belmont around? No, sir. He just stepped out. You sure? Yes, sir. He went out the back door not a minute ago. Bigham and Cassidy are out there, aren't they? <clears throat> yeah, he won't go for it. Oh, there's Mr. Belmont. Mr. Belmont, these gentlemen want to see you. Running up the stairs to Mezzanine. Come on. All right, Belmont. Wait a minute. Watch that barrel. Oh, watch. Look out. Pushing that barrel down the stairs. Let's go. Come on. There he is. He's trying to reach that skylight. Belmont, get on. You'll never make it. He's slipping, Joe. Belmont! <laughs> Come on. You didn't do that showcase any good. Yeah. He's through. Piece of that glass. Right through him. Yeah. It's a rough way to go. And... Yeah. At least narcotics didn't kill him. Didn't it? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 10th, 1948, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Twelve members of Arthur Z. Belmont's narcotics gang were finally rounded up by federal, state, and local authorities. All 12 were tried and convicted of violating the Harrison Act and the State Narcotics Act. They received sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their terms in state and federal penitentiaries. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton... Los Angeles Police Department. The team of cigarettes, best of all, on cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in Halls of Ivy tomorrow on NBC. Welcome back. The big man can feel like a really uneven story. Part one is an intriguing deep dive into the seamy world of drug dealers. Part two is a much slower paced and honestly much more bureaucratic story in setting up this massive operation in which our heroes are ultimately two moving parts among many. Thankfully, we didn't get more of the four-hour meeting. Yet, I think, uh, looked at as part of the whole body of work for Dragnet, it serves as a counterbalance. The story of the hero on his own, winging it in an exciting and dangerous situation. And then a second part where he's just part of a team in a well-planned and well-coordinated operation. 
I also think the very short but effective scene where Friday was shown the picture of the 19-year-old who died from the overdose was a key moment. It was a prelude to the action. Yes, a lot of what the police are going to do will be uh, very complicated, involved, and slow-moving, but don't mistake that for it being unimportant. I guess I need to revise my remarks about the police diet that I made in part one, given Friday's comments at the start of the episode about the Slats gang not knowing where to eat. William Conrad was playing the gang member in question who insulted the steam table Friday thought was a good option, and he delivered it with such conviction that I totally bought that the food was awful, and as a cop, Friday was used to eating poorly. That's what conviction and confidence will do for you. You can sell anything. You must be right, Mr. Drug Dealer. Where would you suggest eating? It does make me wonder where the Slats gang ate. Was it like a lot of greasy spoon places, or were they eating at places that just served junk food? Friday is a guy who I think eats his vegetables and generally eats, if not super healthy by modern standards, is not someone who's going to be happy with getting a diet of junk food. It does suggest an idea for a podcast where an ex-cop and an ex-drug dealer debate their food preferences and taste. The one thing I will say for the Slats gang is that Friday probably didn't get a deviled egg sandwich the whole time, which might be enough to get Romero to consider going undercover next time. Well, listener comments and feedback now. We have an email from George who says, Hi again, Adam. I'm really enjoying rehearing these great Dragnet episodes and thought that the J thumb rings was a particularly fine example. Like you, I thought the questioning of the young boy was very well written, but with one quibble in terms of believability, I would have thought that Ben Romero would have been the likely one to succeed, unless I'm mi getting him mixed up with other partners. Was he not a family man and probably used to talking to children, something that childless people are not always good at? Joe Friday, on the other hand, while normally a great interrogator, would often, at least in later seasons, be quite short and impatient with kids, especially in his curt and brash listen boy approach. While rather grating to listen to, it at least fits his personality. But no matter, I love hearing these again, and I just thought I'd share the impression I received. As always, keep up the great work. Well, thank you so much, George. There are a couple of things I would say on that. First of all, when we're talking about the color seasons, mostly you're talking about Friday dealing with teenage delinquents or even early 20-year-old delinquents. Dealing with 20-year-olds or teenagers and dealing with 6-year-olds are two entirely different things. I've known a lot of people without kids who have gotten on really well with children they're not related to. Certainly, I tended to get on with kids, and honestly, some of the experiences I had with my nephews and with a neighbor kid gave me the confidence I needed to go forward with the whole adoption process. The other thing I would say is that I think Friday gets a bad rap when it comes to kids in general. As I said, when he has the most intense encounters, it tends to be with kids who have done something really seriously wrong. But I think that there is some real care that goes into that. I think of the Season 3, Episode 19, uh, DR... 19 uh, juvenile division where he's dealing with a, a battered child. Another season three episode, DR 05. So, two shows uh, Friday working through a variety of different calls in juvenile division. And then you have episodes like Big Kids from season one. Or the departure from season four, where he has some hard words 
but there's a bit of an understanding that's reached. And there are other episodes like the big present where, or the big complex where even though the juvenile's done something wrong, Friday is still there in a compassionate way. I tend to think that folks misjudge Joe Friday just based on how our culture has uh, changed and evolved, as well as the way that dragnet repeats have sometimes been presented, some of the commercials for them, as well as things like the 87 dragnet movie. Friday could be quite direct, and I think that became even more the case once you get into the 1960s. Now, this could be a combination of web pushing back against the counterculture, or you could look at it as Joe Friday reaching that point in his life and career as a middle-aged police officer where he's just reached the point where he's going to tell it like it is. But I don't think, but I think Friday always remained a character who cared. And even though he was very much of his times, I don't think he, in general, had a negative attitude towards kids when you look at the whole work of Dragnet. But thanks for uh, the comment, George. I appreciate it. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank John. John has been one of our Patreon supporters since March. March of 2020, currently supporting the podcast at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, John. I truly appreciate it. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you're enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We will have an episode of Public Domain Video Theater tomorrow featuring Dangerous Assignment. You can view that at videotheater.greatdetectives.net. Of course, we'll be back next Saturday with another episode of Dragnet. But join us back here on Monday for the Adventures of the Falcon, where... Let it rain. Oh, all right. Hello? Uh, yes? Is this Mike Waring, the Falcon? Yes, it's the Falcon speaking. Must be something wrong with this connection. For a second, I thought... Oh, never mind what you thought. Just tell me what you want. I want to hire you. Right now? Yes. Why? Are you working on something else? Uh, yes, I am. Well, then drop it. This job's important to me, and I'm willing to pay plenty if you'll come out here right away. Where are you? In my cottage at Tallow Lake. Well, it's 10.30 now. I couldn't get there much before midnight. I know that. All right, what's the job? I'm working on a very important deal at the moment, and it's absolutely necessary to keep my movement secret. I'm pretty sure that somebody's been following me this evening. I want you to find out who it is. You say money is no object, Sullivan? None at all. Okay, keep talking then. Just exactly where is this cottage of yours? I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.